Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. We start with question number one from Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that Glasgow City Council has increased charges for childcare. Minister Marie Todd. The statutory early learning and childcare entitlement of 600 hours per year, around 16 hours per week, is fully funded by the Scottish Government and free to families at the point of access. Every council has to choose how it funds additional wraparound hours, which some parents pay for. I understand that Glasgow City Council have their own policy on when and how much to charge parents, depending on different factors, but that the council is continuing to subsidise the cost of these hours. For our part, the Scottish Government will fully fund the expansion to 11.40 hours, reducing the need for wraparound hours, and has helped Glasgow and all councils with a real terms increase in its revenue budget next year to enable it to continue to support services. Joanne Lamond. Well, that was very interesting, but I don't think it really answered the question I asked. I've been contacted by a constituent who reports that her costs for childcare have been increased by £190 a month without consultation and without any consideration for the immediate impact this would have on her family budget. Do you share my concern that many families in Glasgow are being affected by this decision? That it's a direct contradiction to a commitment to early affordable childcare? And while it's a matter for Glasgow City Council, what is the Minister's view of this decision? Does it reflect a lack of commitment to affordable childcare or a lack of resources from the Scottish Government to deliver it? And is she willing to meet with parents to discuss her view as expressed in committee yesterday that the increase in Glasgow is, quote, fairly priced compared to alternatives? Minister Marita. Uh, yes, indeed, I'm more than happy to meet with um, the people that you um, mentioned there. This is a matter for the local authority. Um, we in the Scottish Government have a track record of fully funding the previous expansion from 475 to 600 hours of funded early learning and childcare, and we'll fully fund the expansion to 1140 hours. The expansion to 1140 hours will make a significant contribution to Scottish families. We estimate it will save families £4,500 a year. And in addition, we'll implement a pilot deposit guarantee scheme aimed at reducing the burden of upfront childcare costs for families later this year. Glasgow is one of the pilot sites. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Would the Minister agree with me that there is still a challenge for some parents in securing affordable and flexible early learning and childcare? And outline how the Scottish Government will help reduce the barriers to participating in the labour market with some, some parents face? Minister. I would agree, and that challenge is a major part of why we're expanding the system to 1140 hours, to help parents to meet the costs and to secure the childcare that they need. As I said already, the expansion to 1140 hours will make a significant contribution to Scottish families and we think it will save each family around £4,500 a year. As well as that saving, it will enable the parents in, in that family to go on to training or um, work um, more hours, which will also improve the family um, finances. Thank you. Question two has been withdrawn. Question three, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is in the provision of more direct rail services between Ayrshire and Edinburgh. Minister Hamza Youssef. A direct service is currently available between Ayr and Edinburgh, offering five services per day. Uh, but the introduction of an additional direct service between Ayrshire and Edinburgh it has been investigated by ScotRail. However, it was not considered feasible to operate a through service between Kilmarnock and Edinburgh, uh, frankly, because of the detrimental impact it would have on other services. Willie Coffey. I thank the Minister for that answer. Are we aware that under current arrangements it takes over two hours to get from stations in Ayrshire to Edinburgh, all of which involve changing trains and or stations? So there are no direct services, as the Minister said, for journeys of only 65 miles or so. Does the Minister agree that this is a significant impediment for people from Ayrshire who may wish to make use of the many job opportunities in Scotland's capital but who want to continue to live in Ayrshire? and that real direct express rail services could be a huge boost for the people of Ayrshire. Minister. I don't doubt at all what the logic, logic of, of what the member uh, is saying. What I would say to is that he should continue to, of course, uh, engage with ScotRail on that. He'll understand, of course, that any 
uh, increase in a service in one part of the network may well have a detrimental effect uh, or impact potentially uh, on, on another. So working around some of the very real challenges that they face in the timetable is something that I'd encourage Willie Coffey to do. In terms of uh, perhaps uh, improvements to the line and so on and so forth, the member will probably be aware that we have now uh, a local rail development fund and therefore, for example, if the local authority and indeed the regional transport partnership want to look at improvements on the line uh, that, that could imp help improve the service in the future, I'd encourage them to apply for that funding. Uh, but my door is always open to Willie Coffey and other members to have a conversation about what is the art of the possible. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I welcome the introduction of the direct service between Ayr and Edinburgh and say how much it is valued by my constituents and support Willie Coffey in everything he says for his. Uh, can I ask if there are any plans to increase the frequency of the service between Ayr and Edinburgh and perhaps increase the capacity of this trains as having travelled on it myself, I know they can be overcrowded by the time they get to Edinburgh. Minister. In terms of the latter point, uh, he will be uh, aware, of course, that we're working hard in order to get the introduction of the 385s. Uh, and of course, uh, there will also be uh, coming in May, uh, the high-speed trains uh, as well across the network. That will allow rolling stock to be cascaded across the network and free up more capacity and have more additional capacity across the network. How that exactly impacts the service that he's talking about, I will go back and, and send him and both Willie Coffey uh, a note in terms of capacity. Uh, but of course, uh, my offer that I made to Willie Coffey is one that's open to him. Uh, I'm more than happy to discuss with him where improvements can be made. But of course, these matters also, as operational matters, should be directed towards ScotRail. If they haven't met uh, Willie Coffey and John Scott, haven't met with Alex Hines, the MD, I would encourage them to do so because there are some real challenges around, of course, increasing the frequency of services uh, because of the, 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 the full timetable that's run. Uh, but again, the art of the possible should be explored wherever uh, they possibly can. And Neil Bibby. I would also like to see uh, more direct train services from Ayrshire, but also Inverclyde and Renfrewshire to Edinburgh. Currently, there are only a small number of direct trains from Ayr to Edinburgh, which go via car stairs. It's more like round rail than cross rail. Uh, progressing the long way to Glasgow crossrail scheme would make it both quicker and easier for my constituents to travel uh, for business or leisure to our capital city and for people travelling to the west. So can I urge the Minister again to give serious consideration to the significant benefits of the Glasgow crossrail scheme to better improve connectivity? Yes, sir. I, I know about the, Scotrail, uh, the crossrail scheme uh, uh, well. Uh, he'll know, of course, that in 2008, uh, it was considered as part of the strategic transport projects review, but concluded uh, for a number of reasons that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't going to be progressed. What I would say to the member uh, and what I said previously to Willie Coffey was we have a rail development fund there. If Glasgow City Council and some of the other local authorities plus uh, SPT, the regional transport partnership, want to, to bid for that fund in order to uh, explore whether or not Crossrail is something that could be progressed, is feasible, uh, financially viable, uh, and we'll make an improvement to the rail services in and around Glasgow, then of course that opportunity exists and I would encourage him to have that conversation with the City Council uh, and SPT. And John Mason. Uh, thank you. I mean, to follow on Neil Bibby's point, uh, I think one of the pinch points is Glasgow Central Station and by using Crossrail, I wonder if the Minister would agree that that would take pressure off Glasgow Central Station and would make uh, also be quicker services which would please Willie Coffey. Minister. Well, look, uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, he knows that Glasgow Central is our busiest uh, station. Uh, he knows that there's some capacity issues already uh, at Glasgow Central. Uh, and he knows also what I've just said to Neil Bibby, that Crossrail was explored before, but for a variety of reasons, it uh, wasn't progressed. Now, there is an opportunity with the Local Rail Development Fund. There is an opportunity with the next control period kicking in. Of course, control period six between 2019 and 2024 for investment decisions uh, to be made. So if the council, if SPT, if other players and partners and stakeholders wish to re-explore uh, Crossrail, uh, then there are opportunities uh, to do that. Uh, so I would encourage them to have those conversations. Question number four, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to extend concessionary travel for all 16 to 18 year olds. Minister Hamza Youssef. The national concessionary travel scheme for young people provides discounts uh, on bus and rail travel within Scotland for all young people living in Scotland aged 16 to 18. Uh, using the Young Scot Smart Card, the scheme offers a one-third discount off the adult single fare on any registered bus service in Scotland, uh, one-third off most rail journeys in Scotland, and a 50% discount on rail season tickets. Eligible island residents also receive uh, vouchers for four free ferry journeys a year. Uh, in addition, the Scottish Government is discussing with our partners and other key stakeholders 
uh, the best way to introduce free bus travel for young modern apprentices and indeed young carers in receipt of the, young, uh, of, of the planned young carers grant, uh, as well as three months free bus travel for the recipients of the proposed job grant uh, for those aged between 16 and 24, uh, once those benefits obviously come into force. Pauline McNeill. Thank you. I welcome the progress that has been made, but it doesn't go far enough. 78% of 16 to 18s are in education and only 6% are in full-time education. Does the Minister recognise that there's a certain unfairness in turning 16, but for peak fares on buses, trains and ferries, your fare doubles because the concessionary fares may relate to off-peak in most cases. And many earn as low as £4.5 an hour if they do earn at all. In view of that, would the Minister consider that we should go further, we should have a much deeper policy for young people of that age group? Would he consider a short-term scheme, free or reduced fares on buses or trains for, say, a period of three years, so that we could actually assess the benefits and the uptake of free transport or better fares for that age group? Minister. Well, if Polly McNeill has a detailed, and can I say, costed proposal, then of course I'd be happy to, to look at that. If she has a costed proposal and she can bring forward where that money would be found from and from which budget would come from, then of course I'm more than happy to have that conversation uh, with Polly McNeill. It would be great to have uh, Scottish Labour support on the measures that we are taking forward in relation to, and we hope to take forward on young modern apprentices, uh, but also for those uh, discounts that we'll bring in for those in receipt of a young carers grant uh, and jobs grant. And I don't think they are incidental uh, or small changes, they're significant changes aimed towards the youngest, uh, the most vulnerable young people that we have in society. So I'm sure we'll have our support for that, for any pilot scheme that she's uh, um, wanting us to explore, then of course I'll have that conversation with her, but I would emphasize that such a scheme, I would like to see some detail on that and some costs attached to it, because uh, clearly it would have to be found from somewhere. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. With reference to Transport Scotland's consultation on concessionary bus travel for 16 to 18 year olds, it also references the current concessionary bus travel for pensioners. Will the Minister therefore confirm that it only costs the public purse if and when the pass is used? And will he take this into consideration when he responds to that consultation? Minister. Yes, I will. The, response, the consultation was extraordinarily popular with almost 3,000 members of the public more than 100 organisations offering their views. So we're considering all those views that have been expressed in that consultation and will shortly in the next coming, in the coming few weeks be able to give more information on how we intend to proceed uh, on that. But the benefits uh, of the National Concessionary Travel Scheme, of course, we, we understand them. It's why we've been funding the scheme uh, for all the time that we've, of course, been in government. And I hope other members will uh, help us to come to a sustainable solution for that the Concessionary Travel Scheme, but also support us on the fact that we wish to widen it out to young modern apprentices uh, and, and, and others too. <coughs> Question number five, Ash Denham. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support mental health in the workplace. Minister Maureen Watt. Supporting the mental health of employees in the workplace is extremely important, both for the individual and the organisation. It can lead to reduced sickness absence, improved productivity and lower staff turnover. Employers have a duty of care towards their employees and should take appropriate steps to ensure that mental health and well-being is protected and promoted. Our 10-year mental health strategy aims to improve uptake of and access to a range of services aimed at improving mental health in the workplace. We fund the Healthy Working Lives Programme in NHS Health Scotland, 1.6 million in 2017-18, to provide advice and support to employers on the measures they can take. This support includes a free and confidential advice line and free training courses to equip employers with the skills and knowledge they require. Ash Denham. Could the Minister explain how uh, the Government plans to encourage as many organisations and individuals as possible to take part in the current engagement process of the draft Suicide Prevention Action Plan? Minister. Uh, we are seeking views and themes on the draft actions for possible inclusion in the new Suicide Prevention Action Plan aimed at continuing the downward trend in suicides in Scotland. We published our engagement paper on this on the 8th of March and notified a wide range of organisations and individuals by email as well as issuing a press release. We invite individuals and organisations to submit their comments on the engagement paper by the 30th of April through our Citizen Space website. 
to support discussion by interested organisations and individuals, a number of public engagement events have been arranged by NHS Scotland and details of these are available online. These have proved popular and if there's sufficient interest, Health uh, Scotland will consider arranging more. Jamie Halcro Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Minister outline what work is being undertaken by NHS Health Scotland to support mental health in the workplace in Scotland's island communities and what it is doing to engage particularly with small and medium-sized businesses? Minister. Uh, well, as I said in my previous answer, the, uh, the measures and the support available uh, through NHS Scotland online are available, of course, to everyone uh, throughout Scotland and the free training courses are available throughout Scotland. Mary Fee. Officer, access to mental health support for young people has been spoken about many times in this chamber. We are all aware of the poor statistics, particularly around access to CAMS. That's why Scottish Labour has, has pledged to ring fence mental health budgets, guaranteed access to mental health support in every workplace, college and school, and develop mental health training for staff in schools and workplaces. We know what needs to be done and are committed to doing it. Why doesn't the Minister and our Government... <laughs> Minister. Well, we too know what needs to be done. And just this morning, the member might be uh, interested to know that I was at Kilmarnock College uh, giving uh, over a quarter of a million pounds to NHS, uh, to NUS Scotland to help them uh, develop more mental health help and advice in our colleges and universities. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many businesses saw their non-domestic rates bill increase as a result of the 2017 revaluation. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The purpose of our revaluation is to redistribute the tax burden amongst non-domestic properties to reflect changes in property rental markets. Following the 2017 revaluation, at least 69% of non-domestic properties paid less or no more in rates than they had done previously. The impact of reliefs and appeals, of course, will increase that percentage further. Daniel Johnson. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. I'd also like to just remind the Chamber of my uh, 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 register of interest, uh, given that I'm a director and shareholder of a, a business with uh, retail interest in Edinburgh. But many businesses face large increases following the rates revaluation and are struggling as a result. I know of at least two in my constituency that closed as a direct result of the increase in their rates bill. I know of others such as Leaf and Bean, uh, in my constituency who are very worried about the future of their business given the increases. The latest statistics show there's been a 10% increase in the number of businesses appealing the revaluation, which takes it to a third of all businesses appealing their rates bill. So does the Minister believe that this shows that businesses are just desperate following the large increases, or worse, that they have no confidence in the calculations that have been made on their rates bill? Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. No, I think it's Daniel Johnston and the Labour Party that are desperate on this and a whole host of other uh, matters. The serious issue here, the serious issue here, the serious, I do, I, well. Okay, okay, order Mr Johnston, order. I know that uh, Mr, I know that Mr Johnston um, has not been a supporter of the many interventions that this government has made. And I think that's why the Labour Party's position in terms of non-domestic rates is in sharp contrast to the lobbying that Daniel Johnston has undertaken on this matter. Because in fact, it is this government, bearing in mind of course that revaluation in terms of what the assessors do in the valuations are independent of government. It is this government that's taken the relief package to £720 million. It is this government that has expanded reliefs, including small business bonus, lifting 100,000 properties out of rates altogether. It is this government that increased and capped uh, any increases for a range of businesses. It is this government that reduced the poundage measure. It is this government that's committed to more frequent and quicker revaluations of business rates. It's this government that's delivered the growth accelerator. It's this government that has empowered local authorities and it's this government that's implementing Barclay. That is what this government is doing to support businesses across Scotland in the face of Labour and Tory opposition. Murder Fraser. Oh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. According to the Scottish Government's own statistics, at the end of February, 73,000 
577 businesses had appealed their 2017 valuation. Of those, more than 73,000 were still waiting on a decision. Just 0.7% had, by the end of February, had this issue resolved. These delays are causing a great deal of concern to businesses, particularly uh, small businesses which are uh, uh, run by individuals. Is there anything more the Scottish Government can do to try and speed up the process? Cabinet Secretary. No, I, I actually think that's a very fair question. Of course, recognising that assessors and evaluation joint board and assessors organisation, of course, independent of government, and it is for them to work through their work programme. I have met them specifically before, during and after the Barclay, the Barclay recommendations to ensure that they are fully resourced to be able to deliver this. It is normal a state of affairs that appeals do take some time. However, for businesses, and I'd want to raise awareness of this, if for businesses that might be in some stress, but actually any can apply, there is a process that can expedite appeal hearings, and I would encourage those who are going through the system to use that if they feel that it's appropriate. But I think drawing attention to this is important, all the more reason to support the Barclay reforms as they relate to assessors, and that's why I'm particularly enthusiastic that uh, assessors have come to me with the implementation plan of the recommendations that relate to them and hopefully it can be helped in the future when we have more frequent and quicker implementation and appeals and specific reforms uh, around appeals for valuations into the future.